Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, uh, hopefully I'll get a message soon on my chat to say, okay, I'm getting the message to say that you that, that, that you can hear me. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning to you from um, my uh, work room um, at um, at uh, Talkirchen in our new apartment, um, our new partially uh, furnished apartment. Um, as you possibly found out last week, um, we all got COVID, uh, so we have been sort of struggling through that for the last uh, for the last week and a half. And praise God, we are all uh, COVID free at the moment. Um, but as you may hear from my from my voice, um, uh, I still have symptoms. Um, as do several of the other family members. So we thought it would be best if uh, you did not um, come to the, the service today and potentially spread our germs around. Um, uh, so I'll be sharing with you uh, from home uh, today. Thank you, uh, Samuel, for, for reading our passage this morning, which is actually one of three passages that we'll be looking at today from Genesis. Um, thank you, Fer and me, for leading us in that worship. The, the, the words were just so fantastic and will fit in very, very well uh, with what we're talking about today, um, about God's promises, about his faithfulness, uh, and in particular about his, his faithfulness even when it, it seems to us that things are impossible. Uh, we'll see through these. I hope that what we'll see through, through the, the message today um, is that God is the God of the impossible. Um, that he is faithful to his promises and he is faithful to see those things come to pass. And he is aware of our flaws. He's aware of our limitations, but he is still faithful because he is gracious, he is merciful, he is loving. So let's, uh, let's pray uh, before we start to, to unpack um, these scriptures this morning. Blessed Lord God, Father, you have caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, for our edification, for our training, for our building up. I pray that you would help us to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them in patience, in comfort, and with the leading of your Holy Spirit. May we embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope of eternal life, of everlasting life that we see in your scriptures from the Old Testament to the New, and particularly in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Have you ever had to wait for God? I want you to try and think about a time in your life, or maybe something that you're going through at this present moment in time. It doesn't have to be something that's historical, it could be something that is current to you right now. But have you ever had to wait for God? And has, you, in that process of waiting, have you found that things become more and more difficult the longer that you have to wait? Have you ever had to wait for his promises to come to fulfillment in your life? Because sometimes we pray for something and we wait for that answer, but we may not have received or, or heard a clear promise from the Lord. But sometimes, I don't know if you've experienced, but I know I have experienced a couple of significant times in my life when I feel like the Lord has said to me or impressed upon my heart or spoken to me through the scriptures, clear promises of Paul, this is what is going to come to pass. And at times, that has been a very, very long period of time between when I felt like that promise came to me uh, and the time when it actually came to pass or was delivered. And there were certainly times of doubt, times of questioning, did I really hear God correctly? Times of not knowing how I should act in that situation within that interim period. Have you ever had experiences like that? Or maybe you're going through experiences like that now. Have you ever had a sense that maybe God was speaking to you, promising you or warning you of something, and you had no choice but to wait? There was not an action that you could take. There was not something that you could sort of put into action right at that present moment in time. If you're like me, um, you may like to have control over things. And so sometimes when you hear a promise or you hear a command, you think, I, I want to do something to make that come to pass. And sometimes we are called to do that. That is true, and we can certainly bring an argument from the scriptures in regards to that. But sometimes we're told just to wait, and that can be really, really difficult. Have you experienced that yourself? 
So take a couple of minutes just to think. So think about whether historically in your life you've ever been in that situation of just waiting for God, waiting for a promise to come to pass, something that you felt that God had spoken to you. And have you ever had that sense of, I want to get in, I want to control this, I want to, I want to be part of the solution, I want to be part of bringing this about. And I just want you to hold that image in your mind. I want you to hold that memory in your mind as we look at our passages for today. Because today we're going to rejoin our journey through Genesis. The last time we looked at Genesis, um, we looked at um, Abraham's covenant when God first establishes his covenant with Abraham. And if my memory serves me correctly, Brother John shared about that. Well, today what we were going to do last week and this week was to take two weeks to revisit our Genesis story. But because of, uh, of unforeseen circumstances, we just have the one week this week. And so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at three stories. Three chapters, actually, Genesis 17, Genesis 18, and Genesis 22. <coughs> and in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> these stories, all three of these stories, form part of a larger story, um, and they all have waiting and trusting at their core. There's this, there's this, um, um, there's a crisis or there's a situation that requires waiting, uh, particularly on Abraham and Sarah's part. But there is a there is a there is a situ there are situations that require waiting and that require trust in God. So these stories, as I said, are found in Genesis 17, which Samuel has already read to us, 18 and 22, and they introduce us to the second of the individuals that we know as the patriarchs. We usually think of Abraham as the first of the patriarchs, and then we think of Isaac as the second. Isaac, the son of promise. The son that was promised to Abraham, well at first it's promised to Abraham that he will be the father of many nations. And what we see come specifically here is now God specifically saying this is who uh, this promise is going to be fulfilled through. So it's a story about Isaac, but Isaac is almost um, a secondary or tertiary element in this story. More than a story about Isaac, it's a story about Abraham. And furthermore, more than a story about Abraham, it's a story about God. It's a story about God's faithfulness. It's a story about God's abilities. It's a story about God, uh, God's promises and his dedication to seeing those promises come to pass. It's a pivotal story in the life of Abraham. We will see that his name is changed from Abram to Abraham. We also see not only is there a change in his name, but we see a change in his character. We see a change in his, or a development in his maturity, in his spiritual maturity. Because we have seen, uh, with, as, we looked, as we have looked at Abraham, and if we look at Abraham in more depth, we will see that Abraham wasn't this towering man of faith right from the beginning. But Abraham was what we call a, a person with feet of clay. He had faults. He had limitations. He was imperfect, just like you and me. And he had moments of faith and moments of obeying the word of the Lord and acting in great wisdom. And they would be followed generally by moments of great lack of faith and lack of trust and lack of wisdom. And we will see that a little bit more in these stories. But when we come to the final story of these three in, in, in Genesis 22, we will see that Abraham has arrived at a level of faith at a level of maturity, at a level of trust in God that God identifies within him and then restates his covenant after the actions of Abraham have shown his maturity and shown his growth and shown his trust. At the centre of these stories, and I'm going to, 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 to switch to some PowerPoint here. Just give me a moment. At the center of these stories is this passage in Genesis 18. And this, these three stories sort of frame this statement. And this statement in very, very much explains and forms the punchline, I guess for a lack of a better term, of these three stories. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? So to give it a little bit of context, 
before Genesis 17, because it's been a while since we've looked at Abraham. Let's remember that in Genesis chapter 12, God promises to make a nation of Abraham, and this is the first time he makes the promises. In chapter 13, we see Abraham and Lot's family separate. Lot goes to the east, and Abram goes to Canaan. He goes to the west. In chapter 14, we see a great faith story, a great victory story in Abram's life, where he brings victory in what we know as the War of Kings. And in chapter 15, Abraham laments his lack of a direct descendant because he is waiting for this, because God has said that he will be a father of many nations. So, of course, he's waiting for a son. He is waiting for an heir. And he laments that to God in chapter 15. And then in chapter 16, we see Abraham then get in on the action. So instead of just continuing to wait, he sees that he's getting old. He sees that his wife is getting old. And he's thinking, why isn't this promise coming to pass? So then he acts within his own wisdom. And he conceives with his wife's uh, maidservant, Hagar, and has Ishmael. And then, so that's chapter 16. And then we come to a passage here in chapter 17. After all of this has happened, particularly with, with Hagar and Ishmael, and the Lord comes and speaks to uh, the Lord comes and speaks to um, uh, to Abram. So in verses one to two, the Lord says, uh, we, we, in the Genesis says, now when Abram was ninety nine years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Now, a couple of interesting things about this passage is this is the first time you may have, have heard the beautiful song. Um, Amy Grant sang it many, many years ago, and it's been sung as a worship song. Uh, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Kamkana Adonai. Age to age, you're still the same. So this passage here, where it says, I am God Almighty, this is the first time we see this term, it's not Yahweh. He does not say in the original Hebrew, I am Yahweh. He says, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. What this meant to the Jewish people, if you talk to, to, to Jews now, is that God is all-powerful. He is well able to perform what he desires, even when things look impossible. So we see right at the beginning of these three stories that we're going to look at, we see in the middle, that passage that I mentioned from eight, uh, chapter 18, verse 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord. And we see right at the beginning of chapter 17, this statement through the name El Shaddai, the answer basically comes and says, it comes to us at the beginning and says, no, nothing is too difficult for the Lord. He is God Almighty. Abraham, we are told in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12, it literally says that he was as good as dead uh, when this promise came. He was as good as dead when he and Sarah conceived um, Isaac. So again, God is the God of the impossible. Medical science, uh, all of the people around them would have said, this is never going to happen. But is anything too difficult for the Lord? No, it's not. He is El Shaddai. He is the God Almighty. And so in light of that, he calls to Abraham again and says, walk before me or walk with me and be blameless. This root, the root term that is used here for, uh, in this word blameless in the original Hebrew, which is tamim, um, it actually has more of a meaning of wholeness or integrated, like an integrated nature or integrity. So another way that we could translate this is walk before me wholeheartedly and with integrity. Okay, now we know that, that, that Abraham was not blameless and we know that in, at, from this point on he still makes mistakes and he is not blameless. Um, we certainly aspire to be blameless. We aspire to be perfect as God is perfect. But a strong sense of what God is saying here is walk with me wholeheartedly with all of yourself and walk with me with integrity. And as I was looking at this and studying this word, it reminded me of my running coach. And I may have told this story when I, uh, at other times. But my running coach when I was in my teens, I used to play a lot of different sports. 
And generally in the summer I would run and in the winter I would uh, play football, Australian men's football, which is very, very rough. And I remember getting to a point um, in my training and in my running where my coach sort of felt like I really needed to go to that next level. And he said to me, I want you to do this with your whole heart because I could see that you've got skills. I could see that you could really go somewhere with your running, but you need to give up football. Not because he had anything against football, uh, not because he didn't want me to play any other sports, but football was so injury prone and he was thinking if he's going to put all of this effort into me, if he's going to put all of this time into training me and trying to develop me as a competitive runner, he didn't want me being double minded and focusing on something else that would potentially injure me to the point where I would not be able to run and waste his time. So my coach wanted me to give my whole heart to this to give my whole self to this and, to, and to, to, to pursue running with integrity, with all of my being, with who I want to be. So that is what God is saying to Abraham here. I am God Almighty, so give me your whole heart. Give me all of your energy. Give me all of your strength, all of your heart, and walk with me wholeheartedly. And then I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly, as we see there in verse 2. Now, this is the fourth time that God makes this promise. The fourth time that he makes this promise <coughs> of multiplying him exceedingly. Okay, It uses different terms at different places, but this is basically the fourth time that God makes this type of promise, that you will be a father of many nations, that you will multiply, uh, that you will have children, you will have descendants, and they'll be as um, the sands of the sea. God has already established his covenant back in, um, in chapter 15, where we see this strange ceremony where, where God causes this trance to come over Abraham. And then he, there's these animals that are cut in half, um, and then this torch passes through them. So God, we see in there, and most, most scholars, most theologians will say that what we see in there is that God is establishing by doing this, by him being the flaming torch that passes through um, the, the separated carcasses, is that it is him that is establishing this covenant. That Abraham doesn't have to do anything at that point. This is God saying, this is me making covenant with you. I'm enacting this covenant. I am doing it. But what we are going to see coming up year is we're going to see that God then asks Abraham and says, this is what now I want you to do. One of those things is I want you to walk with me and I want you to give me everything. And the second thing that we're going to see is he's going to give a sign of that covenant. So this covenant has been established through the torch of the Lord passing through these carcasses in, in, uh, in chapter 15. But now what I'm going to ask you to do is to enact act this thing called circumcision, which will be a sign of that covenant that I have established with you. Moving on to verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall you be named Abram, but you shall be named Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So Abram, which means exalted father, sort of like the, 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 the head of his home, to Abraham, which is a father of a multitude. And then moving on to verse 15, And God said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, you shall not call her by the name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. So now Sarai, her name is changed to Sarah, which again in the original Hebrew means princess. So her original name probably pointed to her birth, like the, the family that she came from, whether that was nobility or not. Um, but her new name, um, excuse me, points to her noble descendants. So she is no longer now just a, a woman. She is no longer just an individual um, in this world. But she is a princess from whom all of these descendants will come from. So they will look back to her um, as, as, as a progenitor, as an ancestor, uh, as the one through whom God has blessed and created his people. 
In verse 16, we also see for the first time it's specified that this particular heir will come through Sarah. Up until this point, each time a promise has come, it has been nebulous. It hasn't been clear. It hasn't said, I am going to bless you through Sarah, or I am going to create a multitude of nations through Sarah. It's always been focused on Abraham, that I will bless you, and you will bless others, that you will be a father of many nations, etc., etc. Um, so then Abraham, as we know, goes off and tries to, to fix things up himself with Hagar. But here in chapter 17 is the first time that we actually see God specifically say that this blessing must come through or will come through Sarah. It's not going to come through Hagar. It's not going to come through some other maidservant or through some other woman. It will come through Sarah. And of course, what does Abraham do? He laughs, as we see in verse 17. Uh, and we will see that Sarah will do the same thing in chapter 18. And this is an indicator of where Isaac's name comes from. We, we sort of see a bit of a, a, um, a little bit of a letting in on the secret of what's coming up. Um, is that the son that you are going to have, you will call Isaac, which means he laughs or God laughs. But Abraham and Sarah both laugh. Um, and, and so that's what we see here in verse 17. The first hint of Isaac's name. But also, a thing that we don't see here is there is no record here of Abraham telling Sarah of this promise, which is interesting to note because what you will see in the next story in chapter 18 is when Sarah overhears the conversation about her being the one who will have this child. That is when she laughs. So it's very interesting that Abraham doesn't actually tell her at this point. And then if we move on, into verse, um, sorry, to verse 20. Abraham then says, as for Ishmael, he asks about Ishmael. And as for Ishmael, I have heard, and behold, I will bless him. And I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. So Abraham is concerned for Ishmael and wonders what's going to happen to this child. And God says that he will also be blessed. He will become a nation. Okay? And he will have princes. There will be, he will be the father of 12 princes. And I will make him into a great nation. But then verse 21 is really important. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. So sometimes what we interpret this as is that Ishmael is cursed and that, um, and that Isaac is blessed. But we don't see that illustrated here. We actually see very, very clearly that God is saying, well, no, I will actually bless Ishmael. Okay? Ishmael will be blessed. We do find out later that the people, the Ishmaelites, will be in um, contention with the Israelites. But we do not see that right here, that there's any sense of one being blessed and one being cursed. And this is where it's important for us to remember and to understand that God's blessing upon the Israelites, God's blessing upon Abraham and upon Isaac and Jacob and those that would become Israel, that his blessing upon them again, we need to go back to the call in, in, um, in Genesis chapter 12, was to be a blessing to the nations. So God wasn't calling them out and saying, I want to call you out and I only want to bless you and I'm going to have what he wants and I'm going to persecute everyone else. No. He's calling these people out to establish a nation so that they may be a blessing to other nations, so they may be a blessing to the rest of the world. Their call was not a call of exclusivity. Their call was to be agents of God's grace, agents of God's love, agents of God's truth, of his mercy, of his grace, of his wonder, and to take that to the rest of the world. So what we see here is not a cursing of Ishmael and a blessing of Isaac. It is a blessing of both of them. But God says, but I establish my covenant. I establish Isaac and his descendants, which will become Israel, as my agents of grace. The ones who I will pour out special blessing upon for the purpose of them blessing others. So in summary, what we see in this first chapter, in this first story in Genesis 17, is that God is El Shaddai. He is God Almighty, leading to the fact of in what we see in, in, in chapter 18 is that nothing is impossible. God calls Abram to give his whole life, to give his whole self to him. He restates the covenant promises 
and adds in the addition of this sign of circumcision, a sign in the flesh that they had entered, that God has chosen them and chosen to bless them in this way. Abram and Sarah's names are changed. A clear statement is made that God's blessing will come through Sarah. And we see the first indication of Isaac's name through the laughter that we see in, Abra, Ab, in Abram, in Abraham. So then our second story, Genesis chapter 18, and this sort of is like the meat in the sandwich of the three stories that we're looking at. And this is really important for understanding both, both stories in 18 and in 22. So let me read from chapter 18. Now the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he raised his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed down to the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be bought, excuse me, <coughs> and wash your feet and make yourselves comfortable under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread so that you may refresh yourself. After that, you may go on, since you have visited your servant. And they said, So do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant. And he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to Sarah, and he said, there, in the tent, he said, I will certainly return to you at this time next year, and behold, your wife Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. So Sarah laughed at herself, saying, after I have become old, am I to have pleasure, my Lord being old also? But the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I actually give birth to a child when I am so old? Is anything, uh, sorry, I mean, verse 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, denied that she laughed, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. So a few things we see happening in this story. One is there's no indication, first of all, that, that Abraham is aware that this is a divine visitation. What we see here is quite normal hospitality, uh, ancient Near Eastern hospitality, as these people came. Maybe they looked like nobles. Maybe they looked like someone different. But we see hospitality extended to them. But we do not know, no indication is given, no indication at all, that Abraham had any idea that this might have been some sort of divine visitation. And so once the food is being prepared, then we start seeing that these people are indeed divine, that they are messengers of God, if not God himself. And so then the promises um, of a direct heir are stated again. That they are stated that it is Sarah who will have this child, and when they return at this time next year, that, 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 that she will have that child. And Sarah overhears and laughs. And what is the response? What is the response of these angelic visitors, verse 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord? So again, we see this, this sort of restatement of God's name revealed at the beginning of chapter 17 of El Shaddai, God Almighty. He can do anything. Yes, your husband is 100 and you are in your 90s, but is anything too difficult for the Lord. So this passage, this little verse very much forms the center point of these three passages that we're looking at today. And in many ways also it res it represents, sorry, the center point of Abraham's faith journey. We can say when we look at Abraham's life as a whole, we can actually say what could what could define what would be a passage that would define Abraham's life. And we could use this passage. I'm not saying that we have to, but we could. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? Some people might look at someone like Abraham 
uh, at the time and said, why would God choose this person? Why would God want to use this man? He is so limited. He's out of Ur of the Chaldeans. He's not from any particular noble family. He's not necessarily of noble birth. He's not necessarily wealthy. He's not necessarily educated. You know, we could add in all of these different things. And then we see in his life that he continues to make mistakes and to stumble and then to get up and then to keep going, but then to stumble again and then to get up and then keep going. We see mistake after mistake. We see lies. We see deception. <coughs> we see him trying to, to sort of move God's agenda along. We see all of these, these failures. But then we come back to this passage of verse 14 of chapter 18. But is anything, is anything too difficult for the Lord? And this statement, again, sets up what is to come in chapter 22, when Abraham will be called upon to seemingly to destroy the very realization of God's promise. When Abraham will be called to take that child, Isaac, that is the fulfillment, or at least in Abraham's mind, would have been the fulfillment of the promises that he had received, that he will be asked to be called to sacrifice that child. He will be asked to apparently to destroy the provision of that promise. But then Abraham's life will illustrate that he too has come to believe in the core of his being this statement in verse 14 of chapter 18. Is anything too difficult for God? The statement, the question, the command that he will be given to sacrifice Isaac will make no logical sense to Abraham. But he will be called to listen to God and to trust God and to be faithful to him. So again, let's go back to the question that I asked you at the beginning, to think about promises that you might have felt that the Lord has spoken to you, that you have been holding on to or that you held on to previously. And maybe those things didn't make any logical sense at the time, or maybe things happened as you were waiting that didn't make logical sense. Were you able to, or are you able to say, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Connie and I were, were faced with um, a, a little bit of a situation, just to use a very, very small example, when we were looking at coming to, to Munich um, to work at IBC. And we were, we were stuck in Australia, we were in, uh, you know, Australia was in a level of lockdown and Germany was in a level of lockdown. And we didn't know how to move forward. We felt that God had said to us that we should come to IBC, that we should come to Germany. But the Australian government was saying to us that we couldn't leave the country. And even the German government at first was saying that we couldn't leave the country. But we continued to move forward. We continued to, to trust that we felt that God had promised to us and had said to us that this was what he wanted us to do, that this is what he was calling us to do. And slowly, as we moved forward, and as we kept trusting and as we kept praying, we saw things happen. We saw that the German government said, yes, we can come. We can go into quarantine when we get over here. We've got all of the paperwork together for that. So one side was fixed, so to speak. The German side was fixed. We could officially land in Germany if we could actually get out of Australia. <coughs> but we still didn't have permission from the Australian government to be able to leave the country at all. And as we daily check the flights and airlines, we realized that less and less airlines were flying to Europe. And by the end, there was only one airline that was flying out of Australia to Europe, and that was Qatar Airways. And then we still didn't have permission to come, but we believed that God was saying, go. So we booked tickets, even without permission to leave. It wasn't until, I think, about two days before we left that God came through and provided what we needed providing the permission that we needed to actually leave the country because with God nothing is impossible. And as we talked to other people about what had happened, they were like, how did you get out? We know other people that just can't get out of the country, that they can't do, the, the government's just not opening the borders to them, they can't get out. Well, because is anything too difficult for the Lord? If the Lord's word has come, which we believe that it had come, is anything too difficult for him? And isn't it glorious when we see his word come to pass, 
even when logically everything around, everything in society at the time was saying to us, this is not going to happen. But nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Is there something in your life that seems too difficult at the moment? A promise that you have received from God that you're holding on to, that you really truly believe comes from the Lord. I encourage you to not let that go. So maybe it's not the right time right now. But God is faithful. If it truly was his word, he is faithful. If it truly was his promise, he is faithful. He will bring it to pass. <coughs> the psalmist in Psalm 20 says that some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And then that brings us to our final story in chapter 22 of Genesis. <coughs> Sorry, I'm starting to um, cough a little bit much. I'm apo- I apologize if that's um, um, a little bit uncomfortable to listen to. So Genesis 22 a story that we're quite possibly very familiar with. But again, think about the context of this promise that has come to Abraham multiple times, and now this promise has arrived. Isaac has arrived. He is there. He is his son. And now this happens. Starting in verse 1 of Genesis 22. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, (coughs) Abraham, (coughs) and he said, here I am. Then he said, take your, now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he split wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he took his hand in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself, excuse me, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out with his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not reach out your hand against the boy and do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught (coughs) caught in the thicket by its horns. Now Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. <coughs> so Isaac is born with Ishmael is approximately 10 to 12 years old. Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. And Abraham has once again lied about Sarah being his sister. This happens prior to chapter 22. And then we come to this story. And some of the things that are interesting to see here is that there's no record of Abraham questioning God's direction. In fact, if we look at verses 2 to (coughs) 3, when he is told to take your son, your only son whom you love, and to go to the land of Moriah and offer him the burnt thing, Abraham gets up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He splits wood for the burnt offering and he sets out for the place. So we don't see any interaction here. We don't see any comeback from Abraham like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah where he tries to bargain on their behalf. But he just listens to the word of the Lord and does what he is told to do. Perhaps, again, ringing in his ears are are these words from chapter 18. 
is anything too difficult for the Lord? Maybe also ringing in his ears are the words in, in chapter 17, oh, please walk after me with your whole heart, with your whole integrity. Trust in me because I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty and you can trust me. Nothing is impossible for me. And Abraham makes statements of faith that are contrary to the available evidence at the time. In verse 5, <coughs> um, when he tells the men to stay there with the donkey, I and the boy will go over there and we will worship and we will return to you. And then in verse 8, uh, when Abraham is questioned by Isaac, Abraham says, faithfully, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. And Abraham continues to go through with this act, trusting that there is nothing that is too difficult for El Shaddai. There is nothing that is too difficult for God Almighty. What a contrast we see here to the double-minded Abraham that we have seen several times through the last ten chapters of Genesis. Here is a person whose lack of faith and weaknesses have been exposed multiple times. Here is a person that so far in the story has shown himself to be just as fallible and prone to ups and downs as his faith, in his faith as you and me. But now, <coughs> he is a person, he is an individual who lives out in his life that statement of, is anything too difficult for the Lord? He lives out or proves in his actions that he believes the answer to that statement is no. There is nothing that is too difficult for the Lord. And so then, going on into verse 15 and 18, we see the restatement of the covenant. Because of Abraham's obedience, because he has shown and demonstrated in his life that he has matured, that he has come to that deeper spiritual place, that now, <coughs> excuse me, the covenant is once again restated. Abraham had so far not proven his ability to be the conduit of God's blessing. He had stumbled so often. Abraham had placed the program of redemption in jeopardy multiple times. But God continued to extend mercy to Abraham and to Sarah over and over again. That the ultimate salvation and the ultimate provision of his promise was not dependent upon the faithfulness of Abraham and Sarah, to be clear, it was, it was dependent upon the faithfulness of God, faithfulness to his promise. <coughs> God does not choose to bless Abraham purely because he is now faithful and upright. His grace has extended right from the beginning. But the final fulfillment of the call to Abraham and on Abraham comes only after Abraham grows in his faith and walk with the Lord to a greater level of intimacy and a greater level of depth and maturity. We can only assume that if Abraham had failed at this test, God's will would still have come to pass because God's will will come to pass. But he would have had to use someone else. But we see this ongoing patience and grace with Abraham as he stumbles and makes mistakes and then grows and then stumbles and then grows. We see this ongoing grace. So in summary, in these three passages, in these three stories, and in this story of Isaac, Abraham, and El Shaddai, we see that nothing is impossible with God. God is committed to seeing his promises, his words, <coughs> come to pass. God is gracious and patient. And so three final little points <coughs> to make the message mine. Three things that we see in this and three encouragements that we can take. Firstly, is we need to learn or we need to practice waiting on the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31, a very common scripture probably to most of us. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. We need to learn and practice waiting on God, particularly when we feel like his word has come to us. If he has given a promise to us, don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Wait upon him. Wait upon him. His timing is not your timing, quite often. Secondly, remember that God does speak to us. 
and he does guide us. <coughs> at times directly, we hear him speaking to us. At times we might hear it in our hearts or in our minds. We might read it in the scriptures and feel like the Holy Spirit is impressing on us that this is God's word to us. But sometimes he also speaks to us through others. <coughs> Where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is victory. We need to listen to those people around us because sometimes God speaks to us through wise counsel. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise person or a wise man is he who listens to counsel, counsel of wise people. And then thirdly, don't rely upon your own strength and wisdom. Hold the words of the Lord in your heart, even when things just don't seem to be going right, even when <coughs> it doesn't seem like the promise is coming about in the way that you desired it. I always think of Mary when I think about this point. In Luke chapter 2, where the angel comes to her and tells her what's going to happen, it says that Mary held these things within her heart and pondered them. Don't rely on your own strength or wisdom. When everything around logically says that things should be a different way, if you feel that the word of the Lord has come to you that in a way that is contrary to what circumstances are showing, trust in the word of the Lord. Trust in his promises and don't rely upon your own strength. The consequences of our faithlessness and us trying to bring about God's will is shown to us in the example of Sarah giving Hagar to Abraham. And we see the ongoing conflict between Ishmael and Isaac <coughs> and the eventual establishment of a nation that would be antagonistic towards Abraham's descendants. We need to not try to help the hand of God along if his word has come clearly to us that he will provide and that he will see his promises come to being. Going back to Habakkuk, which we looked at several uh, weeks ago, the Lord says to Habakkuk to record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It hastens towards the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come to pass. Sometimes we just need to wait. Don't rely on our own strength and wisdom, but wait. Because, as the Lord said to Abraham and to Sarah, is anything too difficult for the Lord? We need to trust in his promises. He is faithful. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your word to us. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, that you are El Shaddai, that you are God Almighty, and that there is nothing that is too difficult for you. <clears throat> Lord, if we are struggling today, if there are any people in this service that are struggling with doubt, wavering on your promises, Lord, I pray that these words would be an encouragement to them to not get discouraged, to not give up, because there is nothing that is too difficult for the Lord. If it is indeed your word, if it is, are indeed your promises, they will come to pass. Help us to be patient and to wait for you and to rise up in your strength. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.